yeah. Should we turn it down? Come on, Matt. Better? There we go. But, you know, for the fact that we've all been uh, not connected to each other in the way that we would like, it's probably a good thing for us to reconnect, to visit a little bit, and to see each other a little more closely than we've been able to. Welcome to the service. A few announcements. Uh, I want to ask that you, again, continue to pray for the Lober family. Uh, they, we had a nice service, a graveside service for Margie on Thursday um, out at uh, Cloverdale. Uh, Cloverdale was not happy with us. Um, we, were, we tried, but uh, it was raining, and so we ended up getting a lot closer than we we're supposed to, and, and uh, there, were, um, there were 10 people there. Um, so, but we try to do what we can, and that is something that I want to encourage you all to be thinking about as well. Just be mindful of those folks that are around you. Another announcement too, just I saw this on the podium, uh, for Easter this year, rather than Easter lilies, we collected money for Heifer International and uh, sent that to them, and we got the results of that. There was $555 donated uh, to Heifer International on uh, behalf of our departed loved ones and those folks that we wanted to remember for the year. So thank you for your generosity in that, and I'm sure that this will do good work in the kingdom. So we appreciate that, that gift that we've had from all of you to those that need it. It is good to be together, even if together is a little bit strange to us these days. It is good to get out of the house for those folks that have not been able to get out and maybe uh, see some folks that they haven't been able to see for a while. But above all, it's good to be in God's presence. And that is something that we can do regardless of where we are. God is with us. And so that is a blessing that we have. I invite you to bow with me for our opening prayer. Gracious God, we are so grateful that you've gathered us in. Not only to this place, but gathered us to your heart. You have reached out across time and space to all those that you love. And you have welcomed them in. They have become part of your family as we are part of your family. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful gift that you've given to us of being part of something good and eternal. Lord, we know that in these times we are faced with many questions. Uh, uncertainty, the way that we have become used to doing things is not the way that we're able to do them now. And so we ask that you give each one a, a measure of comfort and peace in the decisions that they make. We ask that you'd bless those that mourn right now, that have to be separate from loved ones when they so dearly want to be close. Uh, it is a hard thing to say goodbye to those that we care about in, in these days. Lord, we're not the only congregation, the only body that is experiencing this. This is a, something that's happening around the world. And so we ask in each of those situations that you would grant that special comfort and peace that only you can give. And Lord, give us patience as we move into the days and the weeks to come. Help us to be gracious and kind, to not contribute to the anxiety that surrounds us, but to be salt and light, alleviating it in whatever way that we can. Lord, just be with us today in this service. Bless your word as it goes out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30 for our first reading this morning. Deuteronomy, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, it's Moses turning over the reins of the leadership of the children of Israel to Joshua. Um, they've been through a lot together, Moses and these people, and some of it was good and some of it not so much. And so uh, Moses wants them to make a choice. And so Chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, beginning in the 11th verse. This is what he says. Now, what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, 
death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, his decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you and have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One of the gifts that God has given us is the gift of music. And this song we're going to sing today is 601 in the hymnal, blue hymnal. And even though we're few and far between, (laughs) let's sing this with, like we really meant it. Take a look at at the words, look closely at those. And could we stand please? my hand and lead me farther through life's stormy pilgrimage let thy light shine brighter father on its dark mysterious page for i find my feet off straying from the path of truth and right the light to shine more bright. Take my hand, take my hand, for I cannot see the
Our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This will be the text for our message today. So I invite you, if you have Bibles, to there should be one in front of you. If you didn't bring one, uh, to turn to that and have it open and to refer to as we move through this. I'll be reading from the very end of the chapter, beginning in the verse, uh, the 24th verse, and to the end through verse 27. Um, those of you who know, uh, Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthians, was uh, more than a little frustrated with them. <laughs> they were doing things that he felt were inappropriate, and rightly so, and uh, wanted to get them back on track. They were not making the right choices. And so Paul wanted to set that straight. Beginning in the, verse, the 24th verse of that ninth chapter, he says, do, not, do you not know that in a race... All the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. And they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that my slaves, so that I, after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I came across an interesting news story earlier today, or this week. Uh, I know that I should probably be limiting my exposure to the news. It's, uh, <laughs> the media can create uh, so much anxiety and stress with all the contentious bickering and the fear-mongering and the things that are happening. But... This was a pretty interesting story anyway, so I, it caught my attention. Uh, it contained a powerful illustration. I don't think it was an intentional illustration, but it was there regardless. So the story was about the way that people are responding to this situation that we find ourselves in, the current situation, financially. Uh, the headline read, New Threat to the Economy. Do you need that? One more threat to the economy. New Threat to the Economy Americans are saving like it's 19, the, the 1980s. And then the lead was, Americans are slashing their spending, hoarding cash, and shrinking their credit card debt as they fear their jobs could disappear during the coronavirus pandemic. I want you to think about that one for a moment. According to this story, Americans that can, they're saving more they're paying down their credit card debt in response to the uncertainty of this economic situation. And apparently that's a bad thing. It seems that if we really want to avoid an economic depression, we need to get out there and spend your savings. Uh, rack up some more credit card debt because that's the American thing to do. According to this story, you see consumer spending you know, uh, particularly purchasing consumer goods like refrigerators and televisions and video games and garden hoses and home canning supplies and whatever it is. That is what drives our economy these days. And when we're not out there purchasing things, when we're saving our money instead, the economy tanks. And the talk turns towards recession or perhaps even depression. Now, I don't want to oversimplify the economy. It's an incredibly complex thing. Uh, it's an organism with a lot of factors that play into it. But there's this strange thing that has happened. Somewhere along the way, we took our forebear's virtue and we turned it into a vice. What our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents celebrated and encouraged, now it poses a threat to our way of life. You see, in the past, people made enormous sacrifices, lived in near poverty just to avoid debt and to save a little money. Frugality was honored and celebrated, but today frugality is kind of a dirty word, economically speaking. What was once good now seems bad. And the vice of being loose with one's money, of uh, spending freely, of racking up debt, now that has become an economic virtue. 
Again, I don't want to oversimplify. Uh, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for us to show uh, the neighbor love that we're called to with our spending, supporting small businesses uh, with our purchases, our neighbor, uh, for example. And, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't pay attention to the way that our spending can impact our community. You see, there's a lot of ways to do good with our money and, and not just what's good for us personally. It's just that this current situation is pulled the cover back on our whole system. And it may be showing us that the system is rewarding, even dependent upon, some of the very vices that our grandparents would have been ashamed of. How did we get to a place where this news story comes across and it says that saving a little money is a bad thing? Have our values shifted that much? In this ninth chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul is exploring an athletic metaphor. He talks about how an athlete will discipline themselves to run a race with the intention of winning a wreath of, of laurels that will one day wither away. They give up stuff that will get in their way so that they can win the prize. In the same way, Paul is disciplining himself for an imperishable prize. He does not run aimlessly. He doesn't box as though he's beating the air. There's a purpose. There's an intention. There's self-control. There are choices being made. Paul is saying yes to some things and no to others. This may not be popular, but it's true. We can't have it all. Does that disappoint you? I'm sorry. You can't have it all. That's just a truism. We can't have our cake and eat our cake. We can't be in two places at the same time. We can't go both right and left. We have to make choices. We have to decide. And saying yes to one thing, in essence we are saying no to something else. When we say yes to saving money, we're saying no to spending money. Pretty obvious, right? We can't have it all, and so we have to make choices. Now, our world would like that to be otherwise. We're constantly being presented with the illusion that you can have it all. There's even advertising that says that. You can have it all. Have it all. All we need to do is finance it. 60 days, same as cash. Now, this isn't obviously just about economics. This is, uh, we want it all. We want it all in relationships. We want it all in our quality of life. We want it all. We fail to accept that in saying yes to one thing, we have to say no to something else. There's a curious thing that happens. Our longing to have it all makes choices in general, difficult. We know, some part of us knows this, that saying yes to one thing says that we can't say yes to something else, and we end up paralyzed, paralyzed and unable to make any choice. As long as we put that choice off, as long as we forestall the choice, we're keeping our options open, right? It's that guy who avoids marriage because he worries that, that, about what he might be missing if he settles down with one woman. Uh, it's that employee who jumps from job to job to job, hoping that the grass might be a little greener in some other pasture. It even happens in the church with people resisting commitment to a congregation because they might be a better church experience somewhere else that they just haven't found yet. We resist making choices. It's woven into the fabric of our culture these days because we fear that in saying yes to something, uh, we'll miss out on what we have to say no to. We navigate our way through these yeses and these noes by trying to figure out the relative value of things, what is important. Now, when one thing is obviously better than something else, that choice is easy, right? Now, we'll come back to that in, 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 as we move along here. But an example here, you go to the food truck rally, and the food truck here, this one's offering a, a delicious meal for $5. Full meal, it's wonderful. You want to get it for 5 bucks. And this other food truck is offering... Uh, small fries, cold fries for the same price. That's an easy choice, right? 
It doesn't take a whole lot of mental acuity to know what we're going to choose. We're going to go with a better value. But we don't, it doesn't always seem to have choices presented to us that are so clear cut. What, what about the choice between the mushroom Swiss burger and the bacon cheddar burger? Mmm. Both delicious. If you like those things. That's not such an easy choice. Because if I pick one, I can't have the other. Well, at least I shouldn't have the other. And then there's that additional consequence of, of not having the money that you use to purchase that burger with anymore. Saying yes to the burger, whichever burger it is, means that you're saying no to the money in your pocket. Which has more value? Now we began this conversation in economic terms. That's what is on a lot of people's minds these days, the relative virtue of saving money versus the supposed virtue of using that money to stimulate the economy. And we talked about choosing to buy one sandwich over another sandwich, but as important as these choices might be in our day-to-day -day life, they're superficial compared to the choices that Paul is talking about in this text. In this last section of 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is focused on this idea of self-discipline, of being dedicated, dedicating oneself to the task at hand. Self-discipline at its core is a matter of saying yes and no. And we'll switch here. We'll switch from economics and pick up the illustration that Paul gives us, that, that athletic illustration. Athletes, if they want to perform at a high level, they need to have the self-discipline to say yes to what will move them towards the goal and no to what gets in the way. Courtney Dalwalter is an ultra runner. Familiar with the phrase ultra running? Yeah, well, a marathon, a marathon is 26.2 miles. It's a long ways. If you can run a marathon, pretty impressive. It's a big deal. But for ultra runners, a marathon is just a warm up. That's just the start of the race. An ultra race is 30 miles or 50 miles or 100 miles. And Dal Walter is becoming dominant in races that are over 100 miles. In 2017, she ran a race that was 238 miles long. She came in 10 hours before the second place finisher. And she beats everybody. She beats the men, she beats the women, everybody in these long races. And yes, there were more than two people in the race. I know that's what you're thinking. Now, it's not like the Boston Marathon where there's 30,000 runners, but there are quite a few people who kind of were into this thing. In order for Dal Walter to perform at this level, she has to train. She has to be disciplined. She runs over 100 miles a week, every week. She runs every day, sometimes twice a day, just to get these miles in. And that means that she has to say yes to the training, and she has to say no to the other things. This is why Paul's use of this athletic metaphor is so brilliant. Most of us would think that that, that level of self-discipline, that's a little crazy. 100 miles a week? I don't even want to drive 100 miles a week. She runs 100 miles a week. We're not, clearly, we're not Courtney Dillwalter. But the Christian life is an athletic life. It requires the same level of self-discipline, maybe a greater level of self-discipline. Because in order for us to be faithful, to what God has called us to, we've got to make a lot of choices that may, in the eyes of the world, seem a little strange, a little crazy. Instead of watching that extra bit of television, uh, that, that another episode of whatever show that we're watching, we take that time and we read the scripture. Well, that seems silly, doesn't it? Instead of buying that marginally useful product that, that the ad said that we needed, we use that money to support a missionary. That's a strange priority. We eat more simply so that others can just eat. We take care of what God has entrusted us with instead of using it and abusing it. The disciplined Christian devotes themselves to the yeses that help bring about the kingdom of God and says no to the stuff that gets in the way, even when that stuff seems to be pretty attractive, perhaps even useful, and certainly what the advertisements say we need. Do you not know, Paul says, that in a race, 
the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize. You run in such a way that you may win the prize. Don't run for second. Don't run for also ran. Run to win. And winning races, you can talk to anybody that has run races. Winning races does not happen on race day. Winning races happens in all of the disciplined preparation that leads up to that race. Courtney Dillwalter doesn't just get up off the couch and sign up for the Western States 100 and go off and do it. She has disciplined herself with a long series of yeses to training and effort and a long series of no's to sleeping in and binge-watching Netflix. This is running in such a way as to win. And we as Christians were prevented, presented with that same choice, the same kind of choice, yeses and noes that will contribute or hinder winning the race. But it's not always easy to see with clarity those yeses and those noes that lead to spiritual strength and maturity. In these four short verses here, Paul, he's not helping us see the right answer to the question that we're faced with. Sorry. <laughs> Be nice if he had some guidance there for that. But there's plenty of other scriptures that point out to what the right yes is and what the right no is. What he said earlier in this very chapter is a good example of that. But in this little section, Paul is just reminding us that we have to make choices. We don't get to have it all. We have to say yes to some things and no to others. And in saying yes to the Christian life, we have to say no to a lot of stuff in the world. When we say yes to Jesus, there's some effort involved here. Not all of the yeses are easy. And it can be difficult to say no to some of those things that are oh, just so tempting. Bacon cheeseburgers. Paul is saying that when we say yes to Jesus, we need to say yes with everything that we've got. Not halfway. Not sort of committed. But everything. It should be such an emphatic yes that we begin to look like the winning athlete. Not the also ran, the one who subjects their bodies to the rigors of training so deeply. He says we punish and enslave our bodies that the prize becomes a foregone conclusion. You're going to win because nobody else is training that hard. And the prize, the prize is right at the heart of this. When an athlete wins a physical race, at least in Paul's day, they, they would have been rewarded with a, a wreath woven out of laurel leaves to put on their head like a crown. It's leaves, basically. Stuff that, you know, when we clean up the garden, we throw out. This is their prize. Now, the, the wreath, it does represent something. Obviously, there's glory and acclaim that went along with it. But the truth that Paul talks about still applies. The worldly acclaim that comes along with, uh, that is gained by the physical uh, athlete, it fades away. It doesn't last. As good as she is, Courtney Dole Walter eventually is going to be surpassed by younger, more fit athletes, more capable runners. What Paul says is, he, what he's saying here is that even though the reward is fleeting, even though it doesn't really amount to a whole lot, athletes will still work incredibly hard, will devote a, a, an incredible amount of work to gain this reward. Shouldn't we work at least that hard to gain something that is eternal, imperishable? Shouldn't we train for the Christian race with at least as much diligence, considering that incredible, eternal, imperishable value of the prize? I want to be clear here about the prize. The prize is not salvation. That's not what he's talking about. That's already been given. That's a free gift that is offered to everyone. Everyone who receives it, it's given to them freely as grace. And so when it comes to salvation, everybody can be a winner. That's what God wants. God doesn't want anyone to perish here. No, the prize that Paul is talking about here, you see it in the verses previous, it's the privilege of sharing the gospel. That's the prize. The privilege, the 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 the. the, the 
the offer to be able to set a Christian example in the world. The prize of being light, being salt in a world that, that draws others to Jesus. Paul recognizes that the commission, you know that commission from Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all people, Paul recognizes that this commission that we've been given as followers of Jesus, that is a prize, a glorious prize, a worthy goal in and of itself. We don't run this race to gain salvation. We've been given salvation so that we can run this race, so that we can make this contribution. We, like Paul, this is what he's talking about earlier in the chapter, we try to become all things to all people so that we might save some We become weak so that we can stand with the weak. We become slaves so that we might win more people. We set aside what we want. We set aside what we want for the good of others so that they might see a little bit of Jesus in us. And this takes discipline because we are not naturally this generous. It takes sacrifice. It says that we need to say yes to some things and say no to others. It requires that we look at what it is that God wants us to do, at the mission that we are meant to fulfill, and we need to make choices in the interest of fulfilling that mission, not so that we are self-gratified. See, making disciples, that's the prize the imperishable prize, and it is worth the effort that we might subject ourselves to in order to gain it. In this time of societal disorder, and it is disordered, I don't know if you watched, but it is, or a little bit like this. Understanding what we value, I cannot emphasize this enough, you need to know what's important. You need to look closely at your values and ask yourself, what is important? We need to be clear about our values because we can't have it all. I don't know of a clearer illustration of this than the current debate between keeping people locked down and opening up the economy. You don't get it both ways. We have to make choices And say yes to some things and no to other things. And these choices will always have consequences. And so we need to be careful about our yeses and our noes. We need to be clear about our virtue and our vice. What is virtue and what is vice? And I'll tell you, if you want to use this book as your rule of faith and practice... If you want to look to the scriptures and say, God, what is it that you have already revealed to us about what is virtue and what is vice? You can find no more virtuous choice than this. To choose a disciplined life. A disciple's life. Paul believed in it. He believed in it so strongly that he punished and enslaved his body because he had said yes to Jesus and no to the world. And yet it's interesting in saying yes to Jesus in a way he did say yes to the world, to the redemption of the world, and to his part in God's restorative plan. And that is the call for us. See, that was a race that he was not only willing to run, he was willing to say yes to the effort needed to win that race. So we are making choices. We are saying yes and we are saying no. And where are our yeses leading us and where are our noes leading us? Are we running to win? Bow with me. Lord, for a moment here we need to stop. to ask you to guide us to illuminate in our hearts the true virtues and the true vices because it's easy for us to get confused in the noise and the cacophony and the ruckus of the world that surrounds us 
illuminate for us what we need to say yes to and shine a light on those things that we should say no to so that we might be more faithful to you not due to the demands of the culture and the society that surrounds us but to you and you alone help us to say yes to you and say no to all that encumbers we pray in the name of Christ amen It's hard sometimes to feel like we have things to be thankful for, and so I selected this responsive reading. It's in the form of a prayer. It's in the back of your blue hymnal again, number 721. It's a good thing for us in this time when it feels like so much has been taken from us to say thank you for the things that we have. So I invite you to turn to 721. We'll just follow along the, the instructions, the guidance there. I'll read the regular print and I'll invite you as a congregation to join in the bold print and then we will join in unison at the end where it says all, number 721. And again, we are praying this prayer. Almighty God, from whom comes each good gift of life, we remember your loving kindness and your uncounted mercies as we join in grateful praise for all your gifts to us and to our human race, for our life and the world in which we live. For the order and the constancy of nature, for the beauty and the bounty of the world, for day and night, summer and winter, seed time and harvest, for the very joys which every season brings. For the work that we are enabled to do and the truth that we are permitted to discover. For whatever good there has been in our past and for all the hopes which lead us on toward better things. For all the joys and comforts of life for homes and families, for our friends, both near and far, for the love, sympathy, and goodwill of persons, also near and far. For all cultures, wise government, and just laws, which order our common life for education and all the treasures of literature, science, and art, for the discipline of life, for the tasks and trials which train us to know ourselves and which bring us to accept one another, for the desire and power to help others, for every opportunity of serving our generation in ways large or small, for the gift of Jesus Christ, and everything which is ours as his disciples, for the presence and the inspiration of your Holy Spirit throughout our days. For the tender ties that bind us to the unseen world, for the faith which dispels the shadows of earth and fills the closing years of life with the light of hope. God of all grace and love, we have praised you with our lips, for all the richness and meaning that life holds for us. Now send us into the world to praise you with our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And turn to 546. Guide my feet. We'll sing all six verses.
bow with me once again. <clears throat> Gracious God, keeper, protector, giver of peace, be with these your people this week and in the weeks to come. Grant them safety and security and a more clear sense of what it is you would have them do. And Lord, give them the strength to do it. Bring us together again soon so that we may worship you again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may go in peace.